I can't believe I'm at the halfway point. Yeah. Welcome yet again to my Faith and Fitness Personal Challenge. Week number six, we're halfway through this challenge. Thank God. This is my video diary. It's a personal challenge for me to ride my Peloton bike five days a week for 30 to 45 minutes. Do 30 minutes of strength training in the evening five days a week for at least 30 minutes. To do Bible study and prayer for one hour a day all week long. Jesus said, could you not watch and pray one hour? I'm trying, Lord, I'm trying. So this week I spent an hour every day kind of working through the Lord's Prayer and studying Daniel chapter six. Is Daniel in the lion's den? <laughs> kitty, 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 kitty. Such a good little kitty. So let's review week number six, shall we? Let's begin with the fitness side of the house. How did this week go? So, beginning week number six, day 34, with Jess King's Ride of Shame. I think this is my new tradition now. I just love starting the week out with this ride. It's tip typically a Saturday ride. Uh, of course, made to the gym Monday night for chess. Now, the next day, Tuesday, I took a recovery ride because I'm still, still recovering from Jess King's Ride of Shame, but I still burned 510 calories. Made to the gym for Tuesday night triceps. Look at my little workout partner, ninth grade, getting ready to impress the sophomore girls, I think, building up those triceps. Now, Wednesday, day 36, I did this 90s pop ride. This killed me my body is still laying back there on that bike 685 calories made to the gym for wednesday night uh, curls for the girls biceps thursday recovering from the ride the day before i did this endurance ride again with jennifer jacobs now if you haven't been able to tell my workout routine on the bike is very simple one day a hard ride followed by an endurance or a recovery ride this has been very beneficial and had the most uh most progress was i've burned a lot of fat and haven't tapped into a lot of muscle well so thursday night made it to the gym to do shoulders Friday, last day of the week, Jen Sherman's 90s pop ride. I gave this one my all too. I had a 573 output, over 600 calories. I ended the week riding 78 miles, almost 3,000 calories burned. Made to the gym Friday night to end the week with back. I did it. Fitness side of the house, let's talk about the spiritual or the faith side of the house. So as I mentioned before, this week I spent it in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel in the lion's den. Alright, let's talk about what I learned in Daniel chapter 6. Boom! Daniel is now in his 80s. Remember back in chapter 1 he was only like 15 years old. It's like a sophomore in high school. So Daniel, who's now in his 80s, is given a key place in the administration of the Persian Empire. This now has supplanted the Babylonian Empire. That's how chapter 5 ended, remember? Darius the Mede came in while Belshazzar was partying. So in verse 1, we're introduced to Darius the Mede all over again. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom. I learned in the last chapter, that would be our last video, that Darius is a title. It's not a personal name. In the exact same way that Caesar served as a title in the later Roman Empire. Or like president in our culture. Who was this Caesar, this president, this Darius? Persian records suggest that it is the Emperor Gubaru. I don't know if I said that right. One of King Cyrus's generals. Gubaru served as ruler of Babylon and everything west of the Euphrates, even after King Cyrus's death. Very likely, Gubaru is the Darius in the book of Daniel. And verse three tells us that Daniel got himself a promotion. It seems like he gets a promotion in every chapter. And over these, three governors, of whom Daniel was one that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So verse 3 tells us that Daniel was promoted to one of three governors in the entire empire. And of all three, he was the most distinguished. And is it any wonder? Daniel had experience, he had wisdom, he had a sense of history, he had ability, he had a servant's heart. Oh, and did I mention he had revelation from the God of heaven? Well played, Daniel. Well played. So in verses 4 and 5, we learn that Daniel's fierce honesty arouses the hostility of his corrupt co-workers. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault, because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, 
We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Daniel's promotion to one of the three governors of, of the empire and being the favorite of the king, and his spiritual reputation, it aroused intense jealousy. And later on in verse 13, we're given even a more clear picture of what they really think of Daniel, of where this jealousy is coming from. Coming from two things, man. Number one, according to verse 13, part of this was racial antagonism. And here we go again with the anti-Semitism. Here Daniel is a governor of Babylon, and how do his accusers refer to him in verse 13? One of the captives of Judah. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, part of this is racial and the other part is a natural jealousy. In other words, sore losers. And get this, by the time we get to chapter 6, Daniel has been in Babylon for over 60 years. According to chapter 5 verse 13, his loyalty to the rulers of Babylon was well known. But despite his loyalty, his consistent faithfulness to God brought jealousy and a threat to his life. We saw this with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, if you're gonna be accused of something, your faithfulness and commitment to God, I'll take that. I am by far not even close to being a Daniel, but I wanna be. So in verses six through 12, these accusers of Daniel, they appeal to the pride of the Persian ruler, Baru, Darius the Mede, and they get him to make a decree that no one can make a request to either man or God other than to himself for 30 days. Dude, are you kidding me? All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for thirty days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Thrown to the lions? Why is everybody in the ancient world so brutal? We're not even done being brutal. Wait till we get to the end of this chapter. Now guess what? In verse 8, this decree, this new law, when it's put into effect, it's put into effect. It can't be changed. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. This truth about a Persian law not being able to be changed has been confirmed in two other sources. So you can't pray, make requests to God or man. You have to go to the king. That is such pride. Huh, I wonder what Daniel's going to do about it in verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Daniel prayed where he always had prayed, in his home, upstairs, window open, facing Jerusalem. That's how he talked to God. Daniel did not directly challenge Darius's law, but neither would he retreat from his open commitment to God. There is a serious balance here that Daniel does that's very difficult for us to maintain. You know what? I got a question. I wonder if these jealous, racist accusers of Daniel are going to sit off and spy on him to see if he's going to break the new law. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Well, they catch Daniel doing as was his custom since early days, and they go tell the king. Ooh, and he's not happy. So in verses 13 to 16, we learn that the distraught ruler, Gubaru, is unable to save Daniel. But as we already learned, custom demanded that once a decree was made by a Persian ruler, it can't be changed that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He labored all night but to no avail. So in verse 16, the king did what he had to do. As Daniel is being thrown to the lions. The king's last hope is that somehow Daniel's God, the God of the Bible, will be able to save him. So the king gave the command 
and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. These words of the king to Daniel right before he's going to execute him, it shows a budding faith or a hope that King Darius had. The king knew and he valued Daniel's ultimate allegiance to the living God. Daniel converts everybody he's around. So in verses 17 to 23, after a sleepless night, king rushes to the den to discover Daniel alive and well. I love Daniel's intimate response to the king. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? O king, Live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me. Because I was found innocent before him, and also, O oh king, I have done no wrong before you. Daniel said that my God sent his angel. This miracle, this angel, which means messenger, could very well be that fourth person that we saw walking in the fire. None other than the Lord Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate appearance. So the chapter concludes in verses 24 to 28, and it's graphic. Daniel's accusers, the plotters, are thrown into the lion's den themselves. These people in the ancient world did not play around. Look what happens in verse 24, man. And the king gave the command. And they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. This sin against God, Darius, and Daniel cost these men and their families their lives. These were hungry kitty cats. And the king decrees that throughout his realm, all men must honor the God of Daniel. Where have we heard that before? And this chapter clearly teaches us to keep on doing what's right and rely on God to guard you. Sometimes that's easier said than done, isn't it? See you next week for Daniel chapter 7. Boom!